Hello, this is Something Rhymes With Purple with me, Susie Dent, and uh, my host, as ever, Giles Brandis. And Giles, it's nearly Christmas and we're still on tour because after visiting the East Coast of North America four weeks ago, we're continuing to drive south. And today we are stopping off at what I think is one of your favourite places in the world, New Orleans. And before you tell us all about your experiences, we would also love to hear from any purple people who are from New Orleans, because we are tourists, especially me. I have never been there. It's on my bucket list. And we only really have time to scratch the surface today. So we would love to hear from you. But Giles, take it away, because you love this place, this city, don't you? I love this place. I love Christmas. This is a podcast about words and language, so we're going to explore some of the words and language I may have come across when visiting New Orleans. I'm looking forward to Christmas, by the way. This Mm -hmm. year, we say we're on tour and going to New Orleans, not literally. I'm going to be spending Christmas Day locally in London. I live in southwest London, in a part of London called Barnes. I shall be at the Red Lion Pub on nice. Christmas Day with some of my family. Where will you actually be on Christmas Day, Susie? I will be at home also with my family. And it's this all sort of fairly low-key but lovely, I would say. What I really adore is just the fact that everything stops and it allows you to breathe. It's suspired, remember? Breathe out. Low-key but lovely. Who could ask for anything more? That's what one wants. Though I sometimes want excitement. And, and over the years, I've had some amazingly exciting Christmases. One year, and we won't talk about that today, I actually spent Christmas in Bethlehem. And I was in Manger Square and went to the church of the Nativity there in Bethlehem. That was an interesting experience. But I have spent Christmas in New Orleans, Mm. which is fantastic. New Orleans, one of the most important cities in the United States, largely because of its strategic location near the mouth of the Mississippi River, I was introduced to New Orleans and to the Mississippi, really, because as a boy, I read the works of Mark Twain, who got his name from a cry on the Mississippi River. Mark Twain! His real name was Samuel Clements. And if you want to know that part of the world as it was in his day, you can't do better than read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, two great American classics. So I spent Christmas there, oh, a long time ago, the Hotel Pontchartrain, Lake Pontchartrain, which abuts Mississippi, has, I think, it certainly did in those days, the longest bridge crossing it of anywhere in the world, leading you into New Orleans. And wow. we stayed in a, a beautiful hotel right in the heart of the, the jazz part of the city of New Orleans. And what I remember most vividly about the lunch, it was Creole cooking, which is fantastic. But after this main course and the starters, which are all Creole, they offered us no Christmas pudding, but you're going to have mile-high ice cream pie. Ooh. And I said, well, this sounds exciting. What is it? And they <laughs> said, it's uh, an ice cream pie that's a mile high. Well, it wasn't a mile high, but technically... It was, because it was about a foot high, literally. It was layer after layer after layer of ice cream of different colours. So it was like like a a pale... Well, except, no, it was a pie. So that picture, a slice of lemon, then a slice of chocolate, then, a you know, horizontally layered. It was like a layered ice cream cake with a dozen or more flavours. And each, yes, each layer, I'd say, was about an inch thick. So picture... A circular pie made entirely of ice cream and each inch deep layer was a different flavour. And you cut a slice and then when you'd finished it, you could have another slice and another slice and another slice until you'd eaten the mile-high ice cream pie. And it was completely magical. I love New Orleans because it has everything. It has... It's a melting pot, of course, because it's been a major hub for immigration and its heritage, of course, includes war, elements of the slave trade. People of all types have passed through the city over the years. And the first time I went there was during my gap year, so it would be 1966, 67, around then. Mm -hmm. And I remember the night I arrived turned out to be the night that the actress Vivian Lee died. And you may remember that Vivian Lee was the start of Gone with the Wind. At that time... Gone with the Wind was had been the most successful film I ever made. Have you seen Gone with the Wind? I have seen it. And 
it is peaceful. And actually, it is, I imagine, actually tells us a lot about the history, really, as well, of, you know, the American South and and slavery and that kind of thing. So it's got that kind of historical perspective as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she was she was mesmerising. She was mesmerising. She was married to Laurence Olivier, wasn't she? She was married to Laurence Olivier, and I couldn't on that night. And so I wanted, I was very moved by this, because mm. though the film... A Gone With Him was made before the Second World War. Uh, I'd seen it many times. Vivian Lee was said to be the most beautiful woman in the world. And she, though um, she was British, played this Southern Belle um, yeah. and indeed played other parts, including famously, she appeared in a play by Tennessee Williams, who is another, who is a, a playwright associated with New Orleans. We can come on to him in a minute. Um, mm. Anyway, I tell you what I love about. New Orleans. It's the presence of the Mississippi River. It's the architecture, the uh, these wonderful buildings with their the railings, the sort of filigree on the railings. Mm. And if you're actually in the heart of the jazz area, it's the music coming out of every building. Gorgeous. And also, you feel in every street. You do feel the heritage. Mm. I know because of the slave trade being part of the story of uh, New Orleans, we all feel anxious and sensitive, uh, quite rightly. When you're there, the heritage of the French language, particularly the Spanish language, the English language, all of which people were there in the 17th and 18th century. And the, the Native Americans, let's not forget, because obviously, well, they, you know... It's that, their that, country, it that's their where heritage. they began. Yeah. And the French came in at the turn of the 18th century, they took over from the Spanish. This was when the city was called La Nouvelle Orléans. Mm -hmm. um, founded by the governor of French Louisiana, Jean-Baptiste Lemoigne de Bienville in 1718. Uh, not just we have it, New York is literally York made new. Mm -hmm. uh, La Nouvelle Orléans is the city of Orleans made new. City mm -hmm. of Orleans famous, of course, for the story of Joan of Arc. Yeah. And in the late 1700s, New Orleans was a trading post, became a major part of the growing sugar industry, uh, and of course, home to the enslaved uh, Africans, who brought their language with them because they were brought to work well, on the, the, the sugar cane. It was, I mean, obviously I was very aware of the, the history of slavery. I didn't realise it was the largest slave market in the US. 135,000 slaves is the estimate, which is just astonishing, isn't it? And there are now, they do have their uh, exhibitions, as it were, where they tell you this history. They, they confront the history. And yeah. it is, it's, it's alarming. Um, but it's there and and it's told up Which front. Which is really and, important. Yeah, not hidden. Absolutely. So the French that they speak, interestingly, it's mm -hmm. I think it's technically called Louisiana Creole, Creole. French. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it, it continues to this day. And then yeah. as you go through the, eight, the 19th century, there are more new settlers come in, a lot from Ireland, some from Germany, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the French language, as it were, began to dissipate, and it gradually England, English became the most dominant language. We should talk a little bit about Creole and the sort of origins of, of Creole, because it's a really complex word, and it, its meaning varies depending on where you're talking about, you know, the history, etc. But we think it comes from um, a Spanish verb, cria, meaning to raise or bring up, and it actually really was originally all about... Nativity, we're talking about Christmas, but it, oh. it was all about where you were born, where your parents came from. It didn't matter who these parents were at all, but it was about being from here. And that was what made somebody Creole um, eventually. And so the first Creole generation was the, the after the establishment of New Orleans, as you say, in 1718. It was sort of locally born children were the first, as I said, the first Creole generation. And then the children of the first Africans in Louisiana who were brought there in slavery would have been known as, as Creole slaves. But it, it was kind of, I think I'm right in thinking it was more of a place-based thing rather than a racial signifier but it is an incredibly uh, complicated term and is also applied to kind of pidgin languages which combine you know as you said such a melting pot in New Orleans it combines influences from so many different languages but interestingly it's a very I found it all the times I've been there I found it a hugely comfortable place to be yeah the people are very very welcoming um as long as you go along with eating what they offer you and mm. as long as you love jazz, because it is the home of jazz. Before we get on to my big name drop that is coming up, can you tell me anything about some of the words? I, I mentioned that New Orleans is, is La Nouvelle Orléans. 
which used to be the capital of Louisiana, though I think that's now Baton Rouge, which means literally, doesn't it, red stick. The red stick, yes. And and we, we should talk about the Big Easy, of course, um, oh. as well. Um, Is Louisiana named after King Louis of France? Exactly right, yeah. So as you say, the sort of French... Well, influence is kind of putting it slightly mildly. But uh, yes, it is definitely part of, of their legacy. So King Louis XIV, when the land was claimed for France at the end of the 17th century. And New Orleans was named, obviously, as you say, after Orléans. And that was the creativity, if you like to call it that way, or the um, appropriation of the French explorer called Bienville. Um, and he named the city in honour of another French official who was the Duke of Orléans. Um, so, yes, very much tied up with the history there. And um, we've got Dixieland as well. Um, oh, give, and... give me the big... You mentioned the Big Easy. Tell me about the Big Easy before we get yes. on to Dixieland. Well, that's taking us into we're not completely sure. So uh, the, certainly the name wasn't really current, or at least very popular, it said, until James Conaway's novel, which was called The Big Easy, in about 1970. And I think, wasn't that, there was a film with Dennis Quaid in it as well, which I think helped to, to popularise it. And prior to that, New Orleans was largely known as the Crescent City. And some residents apparently still prefer that nickname. They're not that keen on The Big Easy because they think it's more of a sort of import from popular culture. But of course, Conaway must have picked it up from existing slang. And there are some people who say there was a jazz club called The Big Easy at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, my bet, if I had to take one, and again, please, purple, purple people who know about this stuff, we would love to hear uh, your theories about this. But my inkling is that there is a link between this phrase and the Big Apple. And if you remember the Big Apple for New York, the origin is said to have originated in the racetracks of New Orleans, where they were talking about, you know, making it big in the horse world, taking a big juicy bite out of the apple, the, the place of opportunity. So I think the Big Easy might have been coined in direct contrast to Big Apple because New Orleans was much more relaxed, as you say, you know, to, to reflect that vibe. And particularly with jazz culture, that suits really well, doesn't it? It certainly does. Well, before we get on to jazz, which we're going to do, and my big name drop, I have a pretty good name drop because I mentioned Tennessee Williams. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I can't pretend properly to have met Tennessee Williams, but I can tell you that I was in the same room once with Tennessee Williams. Oof. Tennessee Williams is, I think, the great playwright of this part of the world mm. and uh, gay, controversial, um, an extraordinary writer with, I mean, just, there's a wonderful biography of him, very long book by John La. He was born at Columbus, Mississippi, the son of a commercial traveller. His original name was, I think, Thomas Lanier uh, Williams. Mm. And when he was 12, the family moved to St. Louis. He was educated at the universities of Missouri and Iowa. But New Orleans is part of his legacy and his fame. And he eventually went, you know, he, he was brilliant and got scholarships here, there and everywhere. And he eventually ended up in Hollywood where he wrote The Glass Menagerie in 1945. And this play together with A Streetcar, Streetcar Named, Named Desire... Desire. Exactly. Vivian yeah. Lee, we're talking about, she appeared when it was first done in London. It was got she, its... Who was she, Stella, or who did she play? Blanche, Blanche oh, Dubois. Blanche, turn off the lights. Oh, a sensational. Now, mm. he got the title from where? Where Where does the title of Streetcar Named Desire come from? Uh, it's the trams, the trams of New of Orleans. Of course, the streetcars, yes, of yeah. course. So that's Tennessee Williams. That's my first name drop. I can't say I've shook his hand, but I was in the same room. But... Wait for my big name. And, and if you say big, that means bigger than... Because you, you didn't say this when you were talking about Michael Jackson. So I think this is going to be big, big. This um, is going to be big, physically quite big as well. I'll give you some clues. Born on the oh. 4th of August, 1901. And I think that's almost... Well, it's the same day, the same birthday as Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who loved his work. Though I think she may have been born a year or two before. I'm not quite Charlie sure. Charlie Chaplin? Anyway. No, this is jazz. We're talking oh, jazz. jazz. Are we talking jazz? We're talk oh, I'm talking New Orleans. He was born in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, come on. I mean, he's uh, the most one of the most influential figures in the world of jazz. He was the, up at the top for decade after decade. I mean, he is almost the history of jazz. It's Certainly Louis, pop, isn't it? it? It's Louis is. Armstrong. You Louis met Louis Armstrong. Armstrong. Wow. You're talking to somebody who, when he was a boy, well, I was a teenager, on my gap year, met... Louis Armstrong, as we call him, but I think he called himself Louis. Oh, okay. His nickname was, 
Well, he had lots of nicknames. Um, Satchmo was the be best one, mm. uh, sometimes known as Ambassador Satch, the Dipper Dipper Mouth. Um, Pops, um, I didn't call him any of these things. I called him Sir, and was <laughs> awed to be in his presence. How did so? What were you doing there? I was a student. Okay, I say I was a student. I was actually teaching at a school, but I was a student. It was I just left school, and I was there during my gap year, and I was in New Orleans, and I had introductions to various places, and he was uh, appearing at the university. Um, he may even have been getting an honorary doctorate. Anyway, he was there, a very revered figure. And we all lined up to meet the great uh, Louis Daniel Armstrong. Yes. Um, uh, you, you mentioned meet... Satchmo. Um, yeah. I, did you know where that comes from? No. So I want you... I, I, I've, I've shot my boat. That's all I can tell you. I mean, I just feel uh, that's that's enough. I could go and lie well, down Well, as long now. as he was happy with it, then I'm happy. Because it actually means satchel mouth, because he had a very big mouth. He called himself that. Okay, well then he was happy with it. Mm. He was he was the top. I mean, yeah, yeah of course. Um, I mean, are you into jazz? Were you into? Yeah. They say that New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Actually, we're talking about language. What's the word jazz? Where does the word jazz yes. come well, from? Well, let's get to jazz in a minute. I'm just going to do a few place names. You mentioned the Mississippi. Okay. A really good example there of a Native American name from the um, Ojibwa language, and it means simply big river. As simple as that, which is quite lovely. It's a difficult one to spell, isn't it, Mississippi? You never know how many S's and how many P's there yes, are. And, how many and then you get something called haplology, I think, where you just swallow a particular word. So, uh, yeah, it is very, very difficult. Mississippi. Um, I mentioned, didn't I, uh, right at the beginning, Mark Twain. And I'm yeah. now thinking that maybe my Christmas reading is going to be Huckleberry Finn, which I. Have you read either of these? Um, um, I don't think I have, which is terrible. That's a big gap for me, Huckleberry thing. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's, the first one is The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876. I mean, he himself, Samuel Langhorne Clements, was actually born in Florida, Missouri. Mm. But he worked, this is the point, he, he I think in, in the sort of 1850s, he became an apprentice pilot on the Mississippi River, mm. where he remained until the riverboat stopped running at the outbreak of the Civil War. So to understand the story of New Orleans, you have to understand the history of slavery and you have mm. to understand the story of the American Civil War to know about the heritage and what was happening there. Mm. Um, but I do, yeah. I mean, I remember loving Mark Twain. We, we might explore his language one day, actually. One day, we, we should. I was also going to return to the Baton Rouge because you were talking about that. And I, I hope this is true because I went to the sort of government website for the history, brief history of the um, Baton Rouge. And it is said to go back to, again, to French explorers and an area known as Red Stick, which then translated into, into French as Baton Rouge. And records of the time describe large reddened poles that had been erected there by um, Native Americans with fish and bear heads, so they were offered in sacrifice. That is the theory that I'm reading here. And again, the purple people will be able to correct us if, if that's just one of several theories, but that's where it's said to come from. We've gone to New Orleans this week. Well, we're actually, we're in London and in Oxford, but in spirit, we're in New Orleans, and we've reached the, the jazz part of town. And I want to know from you, Susie, what the origin of the word jazz is? Where does that come from? Oh, you keep um, you keep sort of coming to me with words that are so bogged down. Well, not bogged down, but sort of nicely mired in mystery because it's one of those words where, again, we're not completely sure where it comes from. So quite often it was spelled um, jazz. J-A-S-S. -S. First records are around 1860, and there had been an African-American slang term, jasm, J-A-S-M, which meant vim or energy, which, of course, makes total, oh, total sense. Total sense, isn't it? Mm. But, you know, there, there's also, uh, I don't know, people say that it might have been sort of jasmine perfume that was worn, particularly by women in New Orleans at the time, or that it's got a sexual connotation. So lots and lots of theories, but we're not completely sure. But certainly we're talking at the late 19th century. And then, of course, it absolutely exploded, didn't it, uh, later than that. You were asking me about my favourite. I think Miles Davis for sure. Yep. And then Dizzy Gillespie as well, I think, was an absolute genius, you know, just a virtuoso, really, of his art. I used to think of it as kind of background music, so sort of something I'd put on as I was cooking Sunday lunch or whatever, but I think it deserves so much more than that. You actually have to really listen and tune in. 
I had a friend once who was a member of the Ronnie Scott's club in Soho, the jazz mm. club there, and we used to go. And I don't know much about jazz, but he explained to me that if you concentrate and focus on it, it's it's like proper music, you know, because uh, yeah. a lot of people do take it for granted almost and have it playing in the background. New Orleans jazz was one of the first recognised jazz styles, even if it wasn't the birthplace, which, you know, a lot of people would say it was. And there's also Dixieland it's, jazz. What's the difference between jazz there? and Dixieland jazz? Or just a I style actually, of jazz? It's a style, yeah. And real jazz aficionados would need to help you out there. But in terms of Dixie and Dixieland, which is essentially Louisiana and the, eventually the whole South, the most common explanation is that it uh, refers back to $10 notes that were issued by the Citizens Bank of New Orleans and used largely by French-speaking residents. So they called them Dixie from the French D, meaning 10. So that's one theory. There's another theory that suggests it belongs to the Mason-Dixon line, and that was the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania. So, again, we're, lots of words we're covering today where, the, you know, the jury is still out, uh, which is interesting. But hip, I think, hip is one of the big terms that emerged out of the, the jazz Oh, hip, era, the word really. hip. Hip uh, and hep. And, uh, and what, what do hip, they stand for? I mean, what is the... Hip and hep is kind of, you know, stylish, up-to-date, smart. Both seem to have originated in the early 1900s. And both words seem to have come from a standard English term, actually, from earlier, meaning shrewd, hep. And hep was also a cry used by a ploughman or a driver to urge his team of horses to get up and get lively. So, you know, th that makes perfect sense. Hip also, uh, we should remember, could refer to opium smokers who were lying on the hip if you like, as they puffed away. So the link with kind of, you know, jazz, drugs, rebel sophistication really kind of permeates through that word. Um, and it's never gone away. It's like cool, which really had been around for quite a long time, but during the days of Charlie Parker and things, you know, the sort of 1930s word. and 40s, mm. yeah, really, really came to the fore as well. Likewise, jam, jamming, syncopation, we've got rips, we've got scat, as well. And scat is the sort of nonsense patter that is sung to jazz, probably because it imitates the sound, um, you know, from one of the syllables that's used. And, and that came about in around 1935. Very good. Before we leave this, I'm, yes. I'm now feeling my, I, I'm, I'm, we're going to the pub, as I told you on Christmas Day. So we'll be having a, yes. a traditional a Christmas lunch. Though mm -hmm. what we veggies will be getting, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, nut roast. A nut I roast. Nut I don't. Roast. I love all that as I long as it's got all the roast. trimmings with it. Yes, all the trimmings. You and me both. Sprouts. Um, yeah. Cranberry sauce. Oh yeah. Bread sauce. But all of that. I have to say, have you tried Creole cooking? You must. You must actually go to New Orleans and go I, and just I relax really, really and, want to. and just walk through it. Get yourself so. Start by the Mississippi River and then walk into the okay. central town. You can walk everywhere. It can be yeah. very crowded. And then find, get someone to tell you what the best local restaurant is where they do proper Creole food. And I think the reason I love it so much is it does contain so many influences. You know, it's West African, yeah. it's French, it's Spanish, it's it's Indian. Um, it's, yeah. it's extraordinary. It you know, will. We could go together. Fantastic. We Shall could, we? Yeah, why don't we go together? It'd be quite fun. I think we need to do an American tour. We need to we need to go we need to, to get out there. Oh, there's lots of places. We need to hang there. a bit there's loose. New Zealand, do you know? Australia. I think this is what you need. Can I say something, Susie Dent? Mm. I think you need a bit of the spirit of Satchmo. I think you just need to hang loose a bit. Yes, um, I do. I need I, I need the big easy, big time. But do you know what? We also need our correspondence because oh, time is ticking. Have we heard from Adam Barishi? That sounds like a, a delicious dish. I'd like a plate of Adam Barishi. Anyway. What's going Yes, on? do you have his email there? Uh, yes, Adam Barishi has been in touch. Hi, Susie and Giles, absolutely love the podcast. Happy Christmas, by the way, Adam. Your etymological expertise, that's you, Susie, and Giles's anecdotes have gotten me through many a dreary night shift. Oh. Isn't that interesting to think when people listen to us? That's fascinating. <laughs> anyway, my question, says Adam, is why does ingenious not mean the opposite of genius? Is the prefix I-N not always a negator? Best wishes, Adam. Interesting question, isn't it? It's a good question. I'm going to start with that last question. Is in always a negator? And of course, most of the time it is. If somebody is intolerant, if something is incorrect, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but not always. So do you remember 
the the question that I get asked so frequently, which is why does inflammable and flammable, why do they mean yeah. the same thing? Yeah. And I mentioned that the in in front of flammable here is actually an intensifier. So what it means is highly flammable, which is why slowly manufacturers are getting rid of inflammable because it can cause confusion. So it's similar here. I'll start with genius. So genius was essentially thought to be a spirit who guided and governed an individual through life. So it comes from the Latin genius, genius, mm -hmm. spelt the same way, a guardian spirit who watches over each person from birth. So quite a lovely thing. And ultimately, it goes back to an ancient root, gene, G-E-N-E, which of course gave us generate, and it means to give birth or to sort of procreate, really. So it is all about family groups. So that's genius. Then we have in genius. And uh, the reason we have an in here is simply that it came via French, the old French ingenious and the modern French ingenieux. And that too goes back to the Latin meaning of good natural talent. So full of intellect, clever and gifted with genius. So they are connected here. It goes all the way back once again to that ancient root meaning to give birth. So the idea really is this is skill which is inborn. If, if something is ingenious, it comes from a kind of innate skill, if you like. So the two are very much connected. And if I had time, I would also go into the words gentle, which also go back to the same idea. It was all about breeding and birth. And a gentleman was somebody who was of good birth and therefore thought to behave um, kindly, hence gentle, and so on and so on. So it was quite a productive verb in Latin, but the in there is not acting as a negator at all. Very good. We learned so much from you, and it's making me think that we probably should do a whole episode devoted to people's queries. Yes, we should have a correspondence a episode for sure. Let's do that after Christmas. I want yes. now three unusual, interesting words to take me through the festive season. Okay. Well, I love weather words, as you know, because I think we could be more expansive with our, with our vocabulary when it comes to the weather. And of course, British uh, stereotypically are very much preoccupied with uh, what is happening outside. So I'm going to start with quite a beautiful one, nubiferous. Ooh. Nubiferous means just cloudy, full of clouds. So if the sky is nubiferous, it has lots of clouds. So it's nubiferous. Yes, N-U-B-I-F-E-R-O-U-S, nubiferous. Nubiferous. Like um, it. Now... The next one was inspired by the fact that I accidentally put in the washing machine a tissue together with all my black leggings and oh. clothes. And what came out was basically, well, too many clothes that were nubbled. And nubbled means covered in small lumps, which is essentially I just had a white bubbled everything, which goes nicely with that Scots word bumpfold, which means <laughs> very creased, if you remember. And finally, I think... Everyone everywhere is struggling with the um, cost of living and certainly the cost of energy. And as I told you, Giles, before we came on air, I am sitting on a heat pad without the heating on at home. Uh, I have become a frugalist, as I think most of us have had to become. That's from the 19th century, and that's simply somebody who tightens their belt. Very good. Excellent. Yes. I'm now, Over to you I'm now. now this confused is my thinking day. about you on that heat pad, wondering about <laughs> your shingles, whether it's doing you any good or not. Does anyway, it affect I'm, shingles? I'm pleased you're warming your cockles. You're talking, you're not talking about hemorrhoids. I don't oh, yes, I think I am. Do you know, I've never <laughs> been very good. I've never been very body aware. I'm not good okay. at that sort of thing. I Honestly, no. I find it all a bit personal. Shingles is kind of adult chickenpox from herpes zoster, and oh. that is very, very painful. Oh, Lord. Uh, nothing to do with sitting on a heat pad and possibly getting hemorrhoids, though I don't think I'm anywhere near that, thank Good. You. That is, I was thinking of hemorrhoids. <laughs> I, we, avoid, a word I avoid because I didn't know how to spell it. Um, oh, yeah, we, we'll, I'm sure. And poor Adam, who wrote in, will uh, be working on his night shift, and we've got a real shock from us talking about piles. Anyway, do you have a poem? I've got a special poem, actually, because we talked about Tennessee Williams, yeah. one of the great American writers associated with New Orleans. And this, I think, is a beautiful... He wrote some wonderful poetry as well as some very great plays. This is a poem called We Have Not Long to Love. It's by Tennessee Williams. We have not long to love. Light does not stay. The tender things are those we fold away. Coarse fabrics are the ones for common wear. In silence, I have watched you comb your hair. Intimate the silence, dim and warm. I could, but did not reach to touch your arm. I could, but do not break that which is still. Almost the faintest whisper 
would be shrill. So moments pass as though they wish to stay. We have not long to love, a night, a day. Oh, that's so wistful. It is wistful. And very it's, beautiful. It's, uh, and I've heard it read by Tennessee Williams, which is a very different experience, and I felt mm. it would be insulting to his poem to attempt it in an American accent. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. But it's, 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 find it. In fact, we, it'll be on the notes for the show, so you'll be able to read it. And uh, it, it's powerful stuff. And Good. part of what it's saying is seize the moment. Seize the day. Carpe Absolutely. diem. The light will not always be there. And if you're Stella, as we said, you will want it switched off. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to us today. Um, just a reminder that for our 200th birthday on the 31st of January, we want to challenge the purple people to submit their, is there a word for that? for X, Y, or Z, for their head scratches. And on the 31st of January, we'll try to find the answer. For example, one purple person has submitted, what do you call the relief you experience when that scary call or meeting is cancelled at the last minute? Oh, that uh, kind of... Oh, I, what a brilliant... I'd love a proper word for that. Also, I know, I can have my work cut out. The condition that I'm suffering from, an inability to grow up. I suppose it's well, a, suffering from a Peter Panic... That's quite Peter good. <laughs> yeah. Please submit any entries by the 31st of uh, December and please keep following us wherever you get your podcasts and please do recommend us to friends and family. That would mean a huge amount to us. And thank you for all those who have joined the Purple Plus Club where you can listen ad-free and you can have special bonus episodes on words and language. And you can find us on social media. We are on at Something Rhymes on Twitter and Facebook or at Something Rhymes with on Instagram. And we're also in the street and people often come up to me and say I'm a purple person and I love it. Uh, so thank you for that. We want to wish everyone a very purple Christmas, a wonderful, wordy Christmas and just have a great time. Just And also, yes. what did you begin by telling us to what we want to do at Christmas? Hang out, chill? What, what was the, what you said? You said a wonderful turn of phrase. You got about being... Suspire. Easy. Breathe out with a sigh. Oh, the end of the year is coming. Let's yes. suspire. Exactly. Something Rhymes with Purple is a something else in Sony Music Entertainment production. It was produced by Harriet Wells with additional production from Chris Skinner, Jen Mystery, Jay Beale, Teddy Riley and the Christmas Beardy Weirdy. Golly. Some people think he's like Santa and say he can't be real, but we've seen him. We know he's real. <laughs>